Hey everyone, Tu Bishvat Sameach. We just had another extraordinary shiur uh, on the Jewish ideology based on the Chazonish, answering some serious questions, whether it would be an advantage or disadvantage to be born into a very righteous family. One of the great families in Hasidut, the Abu Chatzir family, the Pinto family, the Bobov, Tzans, all these extraordinary families we have in Judaism today is an advantage, disadvantage, uh, what about all the things that people say about uh, being absolved from sin, similar to some other religions, where if you go to uh, Uman, if you go to the Rebbe's Kevil, or simply if you're related to Avraham Avinu, like all Jews, are they going to take you out of uh, Genom if you do a bunch of sins? So Rabbi Nachman Breslov uh, agree with that. Does the Lubavitcher Rebbe agree with it? What about Avraham Avinu? Does he have anything to say? Tonight we're going to find out. Tonight we're going to learn. Tonight we're going to look at the sources and once and for all have the answers of what the truth is according to the Holy Torah, the truth that's going to help us know and most importantly live by these rules. Call to Bachabat Lecha and don't forget to share. We're back here, starting a new week. Baruch Hashem, it's Tu Bishvat. We're continuing our series of the uh, Jewish ideology based on the uh, Sefer by the uh, Chazonish. Uh, a Sefer that Baruch Hashem has changed many lives. Anyone that's followed this series from the beginning certainly has changed their life. I've already gotten uh, endless amount of messages from people that have uh, literally transformed their marriages, transformed their parenting their relationships uh, just simply by following the words of the Chazonish and the rest of the Chachamim that we've uh, quoted in the series. Tonight's uh, shiul, special night, Baruch Hashem of Tu Bishvat. It's a uh, New Year's for the trees. The trees are judged today. Uh, certainly a uh, person that's familiar with this uh, this kula that, uh, of this Chag uh, will pray to have a good etrog, a uh, kosher, beautiful etrog this year. This is the time to do so. Tonight's shiur will be for the Refuah Shlema, for the Rabbanit Sarah Bat Anat, Rabbanit Levana Bat Sarah, uh, Avi Mori David Ben Esriya, Imi Morati Doris Bat Jora, and all of Am Yisrael and all the righteous Noahides that continue to learn with us, continue to spread the Torah in different places. Baruch Hashem, we uh, shared a video earlier today from one of our dear students that made Aliyah. Uh, just a year or so ago uh, to Eretz Yisrael, maybe even a little more than a year ago. Miraculous story, uh, and now is doing Kiruv in Eretz Yisrael, Baruch Hashem, and uh, you see in the video how uh, they're spreading the USBs and the uh, different cards uh, in Bet Shemesh, and Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, getting, uh, getting Am Yisrael to see more and more Torah. that wants to uh, share the, uh, the the postcards as I said the many times we have a whole Kiruv store designated for this it won't cost you a penny uh, if you're located in the US we'll even ship it for free if you're located elsewhere then we'll need you to pay for the shipping because it's quite expensive 
but the big expense and the uh, time consuming part was already done for you. Get yourself one of these uh, cards that uh, can help people uh, find out about the Tikkun Abrit movie, the Hashem Took Back His uh, Millions movie. These uh, films, Baruch Hashem, have helped uh, quite a few people uh, overcome different uh, obstacles in their life. And uh, you're simply doing a chesed for whoever you're giving this card to. Uh, and usually uh, people get a few hundred of them. Uh, and uh, in the beginning, they're surprised, who would I give this uh, to? And then uh, after they start actually taking the first step and giving them out, they realize that they should have gotten much more. Just simply because it's easy. It's an easy way to do Kiruv. So, Baruch Hashem, we have people in Israel and America and other places doing this uh, everywhere. And it's certainly helping people. I just got a message about an hour and a half ago from somebody that watched the uh, film Hashem took back his millions uh, for the first time and uh, certainly it's uh, made an impact on him and Baruch Hashem these are different people from all walks of life some are already from uh, but need a little chizuk some are uh, uh, people that are completely new to the religion new to Judaism even if they were born to Jewish parents some are new even if they weren't born to Jewish parents but needless to say these films and different lectures have helped quite a few people uh, anyone that wants to support it and help us continue giving all this stuff out for free, the lectures for free, the videos, the USBs, everything for free, can donate on the uh, website, bezlatashem.org or bhtorah.org uh, and uh, join us uh, with this uh, monumental effort. Also, we're starting a new Gregorian month, so we have another raffle for uh, anyone that uh, will be donating throughout this uh, month. This month, we'll do it... Uh, for the uh, the whole uh, uh, all of the campaigns, regardless of whether it's the uh, uh, Gan No Movie campaign or it's the uh, different Chesed campaigns that we'll have for Purim or for this or anything else, we'll simply choose a uh, winner at the end of the month. The winner that uh, of last month we announced last week, uh, the uh, Talit Gadol with the special uh, customized Bezrat Hashem uh, uh, Talit bag and Tefillin bag, is already ready. To go and Bezot Hashem, they will uh, get there later on this week, Bezot Hashem. So we've already had a handful of winners. We also will announce the winner of the uh, YouTube challenge that uh, we had uh, now that we've reached 37,000 subscribers on YouTube. Uh, another new thousand of subscribers were added recently and we'll be announcing the new uh, uh, winner, Bezot Hashem, later on this week uh, that uh, we'll get a nice present in the mail uh, Bezat Hashem in the uh, the coming uh, weeks or so, Bezat Hashem. So for every thousand new subscribers on YouTube, we'll be sending a uh, uh, a gift to one of the subscribers. It doesn't have to be a new subscriber. It could be the old subscribers. Needless to say, it's uh, it pays to learn Torah with us, not only for the uh, for the gifts, but also for the Torah. So with that being said, you know tonight is a uh, very uh, special night. We have a Rosh Hashanah. And anyone that has learned a little bit of Gemara knows that Masechet Rosh Hashanah is, although it's a very small Masechet as far as the number of pages, uh, it's a very difficult Masechet uh, when it comes to calculations, uh, specific uh, uh, details, but also specific statements. Uh, one of them that we've mentioned countless times about the judgment of the wicked people. Uh, a person that does not lay tefillin, uh, you know, throughout their life, a person that's a Mechalel Shabbat, uh, different types of sinners that remove themselves from being considered part of Am Israel and are judged for uh, Gehenom forever. Uh, this is certainly a statement that has shaken quite a few people into doing tshuva, but at the same token has shaken some of the wicked people out there uh, into heresy, even further heresy than they were already in, by trying to contradict it time and time again. But of course, after the movie, Genom, anyone that has actually watched that movie simply was left without any type of doubt, without any type of rebuttal, because you have 172 sources from the Torah uh, across the spectrum of the Torah, whether it's the five books of Moses, like Parashat Korach, or it's in the Nevi'im, like the last verse in uh, the book of Isaiah, or it's in the uh, Gemara, like Masechet Rosh Hashanah, or the Zohar, uh, or, or many other places in Hasidut, the Baal Shem Tov, uh, uh, you know, Rabbi Eli Melech Milizhensk, uh, Rabbi Zusha Minapoli, all of the great Chachamim that have discussed the subject extensively. And quite frankly, the more you delve into su this subject, the more you realize 
uh, how much of a standard subject this is uh, among all of the Chachamim, and uh, needless to say, uh, how uh, uh, off and how mistaken are those people that simply do not uh, want to believe in Genom, do not want to believe in judgment as the sages have mentioned in the Gemara uh, in many places. Uh, simply put, people are forcing themselves into Genom because of their stubbornness. Now, here we, uh, we have a uh, very common uh, uh, issue uh, that uh, there are certain people that uh, will claim that uh, uh, either Avraham Avinu, uh, uh, you know, Avraham Avinu, our forefather, uh, or uh, uh, Rabbi Nachman Mibreslev, or somebody else, I'm sure there's others that, uh, you know, are mentioned, will save them from Gehenom. You know, many times you hear Breslevers that are uh, unlearned, uh, and the reason why I say unlearned is because you'll find out today uh, why unlearned. Uh, tell the you know tell people that listen no matter what you know Rabbi Nachman Breslev will uh, take you out of your out of Gehenom if you go to Uman if you go to Uman you know and at this time uh, with the war uh, at hand put your life at risk mamash uh, in previous years it's put your eternity at risk mamash because of all the uh, promiscuity and immorality that's surrounding the area uh, if you don't protect yourself. Uh, 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 you know, accordingly, you could easily go to Rabbi Nachman or Breslev uh, to make a, uh, a, a, a mitzvah of chesed to the, to the tzaddik, but at the same token, lose your olam haba because of all the immorality that goes on there uh, for those un- very same unlearned people that are simply going to party. But needless to say, there are many righteous people that have gone there, many righteous people that continue to go there. This is not a, uh, an attack on them by any stretch of the imagination. This is a rebuttal and a clarification uh, for all of those uh, people that simply want to believe. They want to believe that there is a get-out-of-jail-free card in Judaism, that there is a get-out-of-jail-free card in life where you could simply uh, do what you please but simply do one act, uh, such as go visit the tzaddik uh, at his gravesite or, uh, or do some other uh, single act and uh, be relieved. Of all of your problems, uh, all of the judgments against you, and even uh, say, listen, I'm a descendant of a big tzaddik. Many times I've heard uh, young men and women tell me uh, that, uh, listen, you know, my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, he's a big tzaddik. Okay, I, who is he? And he'll tell me a name, and sometimes I'll recognize the name, and it will be a very, very big tzaddik indeed. And uh, you say, wait a minute, you come from this tzaddik, he was married to a tzaddikah, They had many, many tzaddikim kids. Everyone is righteous. What happened to you? Like, okay, everybody's great, but how did you turn out into a mechalel Shabbat, going out with uh, with non uh, non Jewish girlfriend? uh, This that. What happened? And of course, everybody has some type of story, and it's generally speaking, it's always some type of lust, some type of uh, uh, connection to immorality, a mistaken uh, path. But they all mean well. And at the same token, they all give themselves hope, and sometimes that hope is a uh, false hope that somebody else sells them uh, by telling them, listen, don't worry, your grandfather or your father is a big tzaddik, or your brother or your son is a big tzaddik, so don't worry. Or the worst yet is when somebody tells them, listen, Rabbi Nachman, or the Lubavitcher Rebbe, or even Avraham Avinu, he's not going to let you go to Gainom, don't worry, everything is going to be fine. Now, of course, anyone that has watched our shulim uh, throughout the years knows that uh, this is obviously nonsense, uh, and there's simply no other word to call it, and you'll see later on today why. Uh, but even if you haven't watched our shulim, but you simply have studied, you've studied Torah, you've gone through the Shas at least once, you have uh, read the Shulchan Aruch, you have gone through the Chumash even, with commentary by Rashi or Onkelos, and actually understood what the verses say, you'll simply understand that these things are just antithetical to the Torah itself. But of course, what we want to do is to give even further clarification and uh, elaborate on this point, because tonight the Chazonish is letting us know that there is an advantage. There is a huge advantage for those unique people that are born into a very special family, a family of tzaddikim. Uh, you know, they, uh, there's a extraordinary families throughout in Judaism, 
whether it's the uh, you know uh, the Pinto family, that's a very famous family that Baruch Hashem for the last uh, almost uh, six seven hundred years. You have, uh, you know, many, many righteous people come from that family or the Abu Chatzira family that Bo Hashem has had an endless number of tzaddikim, Bezrat Hashem, uh, Ken Yirbu. Uh, so you have many, many tzaddikim that have gone, you know, that, that, that are still here, that are the families themselves have a continuous lineage of righteous people. The genealogy simply works. It's, it's like literally uh, you see one righteous person after another and the Chazonish brings this up. He brings this up. He brings this up in order to let us know if this advantage is, number one, is it real? Well, we already know from, at least from the outside uh, perspective it is, but we could go into it a little deeper. Number two, uh, is it a disadvantage that you weren't born as the grandson of the Baba Sali or as the son of the, you know, one of the Pinto uh, Tzadikim or one of the great kids of Avovadia or any of the others, uh, is it a disadvantage? Uh, should you uh, cry foul? Uh, but perhaps, uh, you know, if it's an advantage to be born to them, why isn't it enough for us to be connected to a tzaddik, whether it's by learning his uh, Torah, like Rabbi Nachman Rebreslev, or the, uh, one of the uh, seven uh, 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 Rebbe's of Chabad, or one of the other tzaddikim in Hasidut, whether it's a... Uh, uh, um, you know, the uh, Bobov or, or Tzans, or many, many righteous people, or best yet, if you're simply a Jew, you're connected to Avraham Avinu. Isn't that enough? Can't you simply have all of those benefits just by simply saying that you're the grandson of Avraham Avinu? I mean, that should be enough. I mean, he's certainly bigger than any of the other tzaddikim that followed him. Uh, you know, it's just, we already know there's a degradation of the generation. Our forefather, obviously, Avram Avinu, is uh, above, above them all. So, so isn't it enough that Avram Avinu, Avram Avinu will pray for you. Avram Avinu will take you out of Gehenom. Theoretically speaking, this is what people would want to believe. Well, tonight we're actually going to find out what does Avram Avinu say about this. And better yet, can we inherit any of these good genes, these spiritual genes, from our, maybe not our forefathers, maybe not our grandfathers even, but perhaps maybe at least from our parents. If you have a father that's a very righteous person, do you inherit those spiritual genes? Do you, do you benefit from it? Sometimes you'll see that the Admol has a son, uh, and his son is righteous, righteous from birth. I mean, you look at, for example, one of the uh, famous Admorim in the, uh, in the world today, Rav Pinto, he's uh, uh, someone I've uh, followed for many, many years. And uh, when I first started doing tshuva, I used to go to his shurim. And uh, you see how his son, I remember seeing his son uh, sitting in the lectures, little boy that he was, literally not even uh, 10 years old, he was maybe 7 years old, sitting there for 2-3 hours in a shul, this packed with people, and he's just sitting there quiet the whole time. He's not drawing. He's not playing. He's listening even better than anybody else in the crowd. And once in a while, he also gives an answer to the questions. And you see that this kid literally was born with amazing genes of a tzaddik. So you see it. Does it work all the time? So what happens when it doesn't work? What happens when you see that there is a tzaddik? that has a grandson that ends up being like Esav. How does it all work? Bezat Hashem, we will succeed in uh, covering these issues and more tonight and uh, try to uh, get uh, some of these things out of the way because, again, some of my dear students are very, very uh, zealous and love the truth. And of course, the more you love the truth and you spread it, the more the Yetzirah will attack you by sending you different messengers. Of course, I get the messages also, but at this point, it's already I'm already you know numb to it. Uh, but you know, other people they get somebody to attack them. I just had uh, one of my students in Eretz Israel got attacked by a uh, fellow uh, member in the uh, yeshiva. Oh, how could you be encouraging people to watch this uh, movie Tikkun Ablit? What are you doing? You know, it's better that they even watch secular movies rather than such a movie. And this is supposedly a guy that actually learns Torah. 
Obviously, the guy doesn't learn anything. He's a complete boo, the Amaretz, but he's also even in a worse condition because he's a, a considered mevazet the Torah. He's disgracing the Torah. But needless to say, these attacks, especially when they come from so-called learned people, religious people, when they're telling you you're doing something wrong, they shock you. Like, what, what's going on here? Why are you telling me not to spread Torah? Why are you telling me that it's better for people to watch Hollywood filth than to learn Torah? I, I don't understand. It's confusing. It's so shocking. It's confusing. Or people sending you, you know, emails. It's like spam. When they have their, everybody has their opinions by letting you know, listen, you know, you're doing a lot of good things, but you're not recommending for people to go to the Rebbe's grave, or you're not recommending for people to go to Uman and risk their life, uh, you know, because the Sadiq will save them. And all types of mumbo jumbo types of messages. And quite frankly, that's what they are. But we'll see tonight what it really takes to really be righteous. Because we're not all born to uh to prophets or uh, or to sons of prophets we're not all born to really big tzaddikim so are we all at uh, doomed just because our our grandparents are not the most righteous people in the world so here the chazonish has been trying to take us by the hand like little children to letting us know that to serve a kadosh baruch Hu, a person has to first and foremost understand how to do it and the only way to serve a Kadosh Baruch Hu, according to a Kadosh Baruch Hu's plan, according to a Kadosh Baruch Hu's will, is by following the Torah. And the Torah itself, not the New Testament, not Islam, not Buddhism, not uh, 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 any other thing. The Torah itself is the only divine book that exists on planet Earth. Everything else is falsehood and idolatry. Uh, in mes- many cases, some of them are not idolatry, but needless to say, falsehood. This is something we say on a regular basis to clarify right off the get-go. There is no second best in this race. It's simply one truth and there's nothing else. Now, with that being said, for those that have uh, uh, prepared themselves to listen to the truth for what it is, because of course everyone says that they speak the truth, but here we have the Torah, the original foundation of monotheism. Before Islam, before Christianity, before uh, everything else out there, we had the Torah. Torah we got in Mount Sinai over 3,300 years ago. And from this Torah, there's different little branches broke off and somehow claim to be the truth, even though they negate the original source. Needless to say, this holy Torah has clear rules, clear rules, clear uh, 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 instructions by the Boreid Barach, by the Creator, may His name be blessed, that lets us know if you want to serve me you have to follow the torah and the torah teaches us two major aspects one there is the law there's the law for the jews there's the law for the gentiles the law for the jews are the tariag mitzvot the 613 mitzvot plus the rabbinical enactments which are the seven uh laws of the uh, of the rabbis you have a total of 620 of which most of them you cannot do anymore simply because we don't have the beta mikdash give or take you have somewhere around uh, half of them that are not possible to fulfill anymore at this time until the third temple is built Bezat Hashem very soon. But even those remaining half, not everyone can do them because not everyone is a Kohen, not everyone is a male, not everyone is a female, and so on and so forth. So the point being is that only a small spectrum of all of the mitzvot are actually relevant to any one particular person, but the priority is to know that they exist, and that you have to learn them. You have to learn this Torah. So the first and foremost is you need to learn the law and fulfill the law. That's the first part. Second part is, is that to know that part of fulfilling the law is to use this law to perfect yourself as a human being. Meaning, you are supposed to use these mitzvot in order to become a better version of yourself a less angry person to the point of never getting angry a more humble person a more generous person a person that's not jealous of anybody unless you're jealous of a scholar and you want to simply know just as much or more than he does but not because you're jealous of his fame or fortune not because you're jealous of somebody's money or their wife Shalom, because these are forbidden jealousies a person that has jealousy will not be resurrected with the dead even if they're righteous otherwise because jealousy has 
has a dust of heresy in it. In essence, you're telling God that what he has, what she has, really you should have had, which in essence is telling God as if he made a mistake, chas v'shalom. So the deeper a person goes into perfecting their character traits, developing themselves, the better they are as a person, and certainly the better they are as a Jew or as a Noahide. Now, these two things have to go together why because one helps the other one helps the other and that's in essence what the chazonish has been teaching us over the last several months specifically in this series that's been going on for the last couple of years where he's letting us know that the precise and exact observance of the law is one of the ways that a person will correct their character traits meaning you use the law to perfect yourself as a person the law tells you that you have to pray early in the morning that already makes you a person that has alacrity that's in a hurry to do good things the the law tells you that you have to be charitable you have to uh share part of what you have and help the needy that already puts you in a different perspective where you realize that everything you have is a gift from god it's not something that you earn because you have some special skill or because you have good timing everything is a gift it teaches you gratitude it teaches you recognition of the creator and so on and so forth if a person looks into the 10 plagues the 10 plagues that hashem put on egypt you will see that these specific plagues were not just random plagues but rather there were specific attacks against idolatry against heresy by akadosh Baruch Hu, where a person that looks at these plagues will really realize why hashem calls himself throughout the entire Torah and the Tanakh itself the God of Israel that, that took them out of Egypt the God that took Am Yisrael out of Egypt why isn't it the God that created the world why is it the God that took them out of Egypt well easily said well you could say what the Midrash says initially well the creation of the world there was no witnesses whereas taking Am Yisrael out of Egypt there were millions and millions of witnesses sure but we can build further on that the god that created the world there are many many things that happen many everything is miraculous but these are things that didn't necessarily prove to any naysayer to any heretic to any disbeliever to anyone that's just simply ignorant that he's still here he's still the master of the world they could believe like the greeks and some other forms of heretics out there that god created the world but he simply left you know okay so he created the heavens he created the oceans he created the the animals the fish and so on and so forth but then he left that's what many people unfortunately believe in even to this day but the god that took Am Yisrael out of egypt tells you otherwise why hashem gave the plague of blood on the egyptians to show us that he is the master of all of the waters because it wasn't just the nile river that turned into blood and it wasn't just the oceans that turn into blood but even the water that was in the walls as you make the stones and you use water in it even the walls bled even the water that they found that they took from the Jews as soon as the Egyptian took it it turned back to blood if he gave it back to the Jew it turned back to uh to water if they put two straws one straw the Jew is drinking from one straw the Egyptian is drinking from from the same exact cup the Jew is drinking water the Egyptian is drinking blood so here Hashem showed us that he's the master of all of the oceans then you have the uh the uh the reptiles the uh the the frogs some say it's, it was crocodiles and alligators here Hashem is showing us that he is the master and the creator of all of these different reptiles regardless of whether big or small regardless of whether they swim they jump doesn't make a difference he is the master of all of those all after that Kinim all of the uh, different tiny little insects to show us that he is the master of all of these different microscopic little animals these tiny little things that even the ones that know necromancy and different types of witchcraft that were working for for uh, pharaoh says this is it's by lokimze this is the finger of god why finger of god because even one that knows witchcraft and all types of uh uh things that are re- relevant to witchcraft knows that they cannot have mastery over these small creatures only God does so here Hashem says that he is also the master of even the most the smallest creatures 
Then, of course, you see the animals. The animals are attacking. Hashem showed us that He's the master of all the animals, whether it's the big eagles or it's the lions or the bears. But not only that, their nature, where they came from, also came with them. The polar bear came with the ice. The kangaroos came with their desert. The uh, the, uh, the the lions uh, the the uh, came with whatever uh, surroundings they had. The tiger with his jungle, and so on and so forth. All of these different creatures came to Egypt to show us that Hashem is not only in control of the animals, but also of what type of habitat they have. Then, of course, he gave the plagues, the plagues that killed the animals, the plagues that caused a lot of harm to the Egyptians and killed many of them. Here he's showing us that whether it's coronavirus or it's the vaccine that's killing people or it's the vaccine that was supposed to help people or whatever it is, that's all in the hand of God. Only God decides whether these things will work, whether someone will be infected, whether somebody is going to be saved. Not the uh, uh, Fauci, not the government, not the news, not anybody else. Hashem decides whether something is going to infect anyone or not. He's the master of that too. Needless to say, if you look at some of the other plagues, whether it's a uh, the Barad, the hail, the hail was one of the things that defied nature, where you have lava inside water, inside ice. These two things cannot coexist. If you take a huge ball of ice and you throw it next to a volcano, not even inside the volcano, in the air it will start melting. In the air it will start melting. By the time it gets uh, close to it, it will already melt into complete water. Why? Because the two things cannot coexist. Hashem forced the angels of fire and the angels of water to make peace in order for them to serve him showing us that he's also the master of this he's the master of these angels he's the master of all of these creations now of course if you look at the other plagues the plagues where he brought all of these uh, locusts these locusts you would say wait but we already saw that he's uh the the master of all of these uh bugs but that's not where he showed us what he showed us is that he's the master of all the wind because he used a strong wind to bring and a strong wind to kick out all of these locusts from Egypt in such a fashion where so many of them came that it blocked the sun. It blocked the sun and so many of them left that it literally looked like the world was recreated. See here Hashem showed us that he's the master of the weather, the weather system, the, not just the creatures that live or die in it. And of course, the plague of darkness. The plague of darkness showed us that Hashem is the master, not of just light and dark, but simply he can manipulate nature to do whatever he wants with it. In such a fashion where one person sees darkness while the next person next to him not only does not see darkness, but he actually sees even better. The Jewish people were able to see like x-ray vision, to see everything of where the Egyptians were hiding their treasures. They were able to see through the walls. They were able to see through the safes. And that's why when they came to the Egyptians to ask them for, uh, for, uh, for different uh, uh, gold and silver, the Egyptian couldn't lie about it because the Jew told him, listen, by the way, that gold that you have in the uh, closet on the top right, right when you, uh, you know, behind those two cinder blocks, yeah, that's the gold I was looking for. Uh, not the silver that's really next to it because you only have a little bit of it. I just want the gold. And they literally give him exact details. Why? Because Hashem let them see it. While at the same time, the Egyptians initially were completely uh, incapable of, of, of hearing, of, of seeing anything, but then they were also incapable of moving. They were stuck the way they were for several days. And then last but not least, we see that Akadosh Baruch Hu showed us that he's the master of all. Not only the master of all of these things, but the master of the most important thing in life, which is life itself. Life itself by determining who is going to die and who is going to live. And also letting you know that he knows all of the details because in every house there was somebody that was dead now somebody would say wait a minute but he wasn't the firstborn the firstborn moved out he got married no 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 he was the firstborn not to you the husband he was firstborn with, with with your wife but with the guy she cheated on you with and he would literally show these people that their wives cheated on them because that firstborn wasn't his firstborn he was her firstborn with somebody else and these types of things were all shown as part of the destruction of Egypt, but more importantly, 
we recite them every single day as part of our Shema Yisrael, as part of our prayer, as part of our tefillin, as part of everything. So we ourselves are not only connected to this great thing that happened many years ago, but we're able to live through it today. To understand that the God of Israel is not like a false God. It's not like a God that dies after he gets hung on a cross and can't help himself. He's not a God that talks to people in hiding in a desert that only one person can say he talked to him. No, no. The God of Israel talked to millions of us. And when he wants the world to know, he will make sure they know. When, when Hashem spoke to us, he made sure that the whole world knew he spoke to us. There wasn't secrets, there wasn't doubts. And the beautiful thing here is that when a person has a connection to that God, then they surely have much more interest in knowing what this God wants from us. And this very same God is letting us know that there are two critical things that you need to do. You have to learn the Torah in order to know the laws that are applicable to you. Now, of course, this means that you have to not only learn the written Torah, but also the oral Torah that uh, expounds on it and explains to you what it actually means because you cannot find all of the mitzvot yourself and understand them and how they're fulfilled regardless of whether they're the greatest mitzvot or the smallest mitzvot for example the observance of shabbat there are 12 times in the torah that hashem says that a jew that does not observe shabbat gets death penalty and goes to Gehenom. now of course this is a very critical mitzvah but yet in the written torah there's no instructions of how to observe the shabbat there's a lot on the line here, so I need to know how to observe it. How do I know? We find out from the oral Torah. Same thing with the flactories, the tefillin. It says that a person that puts on a tefillin, he's observing the commandment. He's observing the covenant between us and God. So a person needs to know, what are these flactories? Can I just, you know, imagine that uh, some piece of paper that I write around my arm, or maybe a tattoo, or maybe uh, some, uh, some uh, you know, PlayStation game? How do I know what they are? That's where the oral Torah comes in. Let us know what these are, how to do it. All of the details a person must know. Secondly, a person needs to also know that one of the primary purposes of all of these mitzvot is to better you as a human being, to be a light to the nations, to be a light to your family, to be a light to the descendants that come out of you. And if a person uses these mitzvot to make themselves appear as if they are better than everybody else and become more arrogant and become more conceited, then certainly they miss the whole point. So the Chazonish has clarified all of this for us thus far, but now he's going to let us know that we have to expound even further. Where he tells us in the fourth chapter, the 11th section, precision in the observance of mitzvot can be found sometimes even in one who has not labored over the study of Torah properly. So here we see already the first statement in this section contradicts everything, or at least appears like it contradicts everything I just said for the last 10 or 15 minutes, because we need to learn the law in order to perfect ourselves. But the Chazonish just said that sometimes you'll see a person is observing the mitzvot without studying Torah properly. How could this be? Precision in the observance of the mitzvot can be found sometimes even in one who has not labored over the study of Torah properly, but has been educated since childhood by his parents or his teachers to be meticulous in observance and to ask a chacham, a uh, Torah scholar, in regard to everything he does. This constant habit has become part of him, compelling him to fear all violations of the law so here we see that there are people that grew up with parents teachers uh, grandparents an environment that was full of scholars righteous people that taught them this is what you do here this is what you do there this is what you do here this is what you do there before you eat you must say a bracha or else it's considered like you're stealing you're stealing from God. Why? Because everything you have is a gift from God. You have to bless. Before you benefit anything in this world, you have to bless Hashem. Now, when you are doing business, you must make sure that you are ethical or else it's considered stealing. And such and such. Everything that 
they a person would do in life they give him instructions now for a person to know the details behind why and who and what they themselves have to toil in Torah they themselves have to learn the books but what happens when they don't if it was taught to them with enough zeal with enough passion with enough care and by righteous people it could still have an impact on the person to make them their character very fine very good even without them toiling in Torah where you see a person and this is very common among old timers especially in the world that I grew up with among the Sephardi Jews you'll see many times Sephardic old timers I remember my grandfather Allah Shalom uh, uh may this uh, shield be for his Iluna Shammai his yard site was just actually uh, last week my uh, grandfather Gabriel he was a very very righteous person Sadiq like just such a soft uh, humble person always put his head down always said trust in Hashem and uh was an extremely honest person and he was also when he was younger if you guys remember some of the stories that I told about him in the past he was also a gibo he was a hero that protected the Jewish people from some of their uh, enemies from the uh uh in in uh, Tripoli and different places in the Middle East uh they were simply uh kidnapping Jewish girls and uh my grandfather Allah Shalom and his brothers were uh, would fight them uh, at times uh, or or meet with them do different things in order to get these uh, young girls back and of course when there were the bombings uh in the airplane bombings during you know the the uh, uh the wars uh my uh, grandfather was uh the one that would actually bury the bodies collect all the uh body parts uh and uh literally bury the people uh give them a fair burial he would my mom tells me that he would come home drenched in blood and uh you know every day every day you know after collecting these bodies giving them the respect that they deserve and burying them uh and uh you know from this tragedy and uh you know he would go and do this you know in the middle of the night so uh my 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 mom uh says that her and her sisters would always ask uh you know their father my grandfather uh Abba, aren't you scared and he would say in arabic they spoke arabic and he say binchi uh my my daughter you don't need to be scared of people that died you only need to be scared of the ones that are alive only they can hurt you why did she ask him this question because uh, she they would ask him you know what happens this that and he said oh yeah the people I bury yeah I see all their faces on my hands he would literally see things you'd see their faces of all the people that he buried in his hands you would see different things walking around the cemetery that weren't exactly of this world and this wouldn't bother him this you know he uh he lived uh you know just such a you know uh unique life now he wasn't a Torah scholar but yet he had these traits why because from that time these things were taught unfortunately today these are not as common you it's hard to find people uh that are even uh, a quarter as uh, as righteous as my dear grandfather but uh you know just because the education system is very different today the the parenting is different today uh the the perspective uh you know is is very different today but uh needless to say there are certainly good people in the world uh today that uh you see that they're not necessarily Torah scholars but their parents or grandparents were and somehow this spiritual genealogy has impacted them in a very positive way where they're still very particular about observing Shabbat and kosher and specific things they're very honest in business or whatever it is that it impacted them without being a scholar they're still very very particular about all of these things so here the chazoni says this actually does exist uh and, and there's a reason for it and one of the things that he's uh before we get into the uh into the reason is that he tells us that this constant habit of meticulousness of Torah observance and so on has become a part of this person compelling him to fear all violations of the law so here we see 
a key element to these traits, to these righteous people, whether it be your grandfather or grandmother or parents or mine, but these old timers, they have these very calm demeanors, very humble, very different than our generation or the generation that followed us. World of difference. One of the uh, unique people that I met in Eretz Yisrael in my recent trip there, that's the uh, Gabai of the uh, Bet Knesset that we have, the Kola that we have. Uh, he was a very humble person, barely says two words. And uh, I didn't really get to talk to him much, but I found out after I left that he is the son of the sister of Rabbi Udaftaya. And he as a little boy was a witness to many of the stories that I've told you guys that are written in Minchat Yehuda. And he remembers these stories and he says, oh, he tells Rabbi Ephraim, you, uh, uh, because he himself only found this out recently. And he says, oh, you should have seen the mayhem that happened in, uh, you know, after Rabbi Udaftaya was uh, doing the tikkun on Shabtai Tzvi. You know, this, everything, you know, was, uh, was going crazy at that time. This was in, in Bavel, this was in Iraq. So here we see that, you know, this person, if you see him, he looks like an average person. Doesn't look overly righteous. Certainly doesn't look like he's a Talmud, uh, of a Talmud, or, or has any connection to righteous people. You just say, okay, he's a regular Jew. He's an old timer. But many times you'll see that the, these people are connected to very, very righteous people. And the Chazuni says, that connection has impacted them. That connection has impacted them to such a point where the humility that they have, the generosity that they have, the, uh, the uh, whatever it is that's good about them could very well be because of that connection. And one of the main things is because this connection has compelled them to fear all violations of the law. Whatever they learned in their grandfather's house, in their parents' house, whatever they learned, they do it because of that. They don't do it because it's written in the Shulchan Aruch. They don't do it because they heard it from some big great rabbi. They do it because they learn it from whatever source it was. It could be their teacher. It could be their rabbi. It could be their mother or grandfather or whatever it is. Whatever that original source is, they heard it there. That's why they do it until this day. And for them to forsake it is incomprehensible. No chance that it's going to happen. There are some people that have traditions. We tell them, listen, you know, by the way, you don't really need to do it. Like there's a uh, tradition among uh, women uh that are uh you know from the previous generation that uh, the um the cleaning for pesach is uh you know it's so extreme that it literally almost uh brings back the woman to slavery because of how extreme they are they start cleaning places that don't need to be cleaned behind the refrigerator inside the uh they unscrew the closets they clean the walls i mean who eats off the wall you don't need to clean the wall but there are certain women, literally, that I know, I know firsthand, certain women that take a uh, toothbrush and start cleaning the floor with a toothbrush. Cleaning the floor with a toothbrush in preparation for Pesach. They start three, four months before Pesach, just to make sure there's no chametz. Chametz, there's no germs there. <laughs> so, but again, if you tell these righteous women, listen, you know you don't really need to do that. I mean, you need to make sure that all the chametz is gone it's not out of the house but you don't need to you know use a toothbrush to clean the floor or clean the walls or or or, or, or the rooftop or like that stuff there's no chametz there and they look at you like what do you mean i have to clean what do you want to chametz in my house no 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 there's no chametz on the wall there's, there's no chametz on the floor you don't need to do it you don't need to redo the closet and fix all the towels all over again like it's not necessary the towels don't have chametz the, the, nobody eats towels you, you don't need to redo the whole garage that has no food in it and just tools and all types of oil that, like that, there's nothing there there's no chametz and they look at you i've been doing this my whole life you're gonna tell me how to clean for pesach and they look at you it doesn't matter if you're a big rabbi small rabbi it doesn't make a difference look at you like you're a sinner like what the, what are you talking about i cannot clean it this is how i clean this is how my mother cleans this is how my grandmother cleans this is all the way they can tell you from Tol Moshe Rabbeinu. It's cleaning just like this. 
and they believe it like this is their matan Torah, and you try to steer them one way or the other, you're wasting your time. I know, I've tried. I've tried. Doesn't work. Some people literally, they, they turn their house into like a UFO. They put tin foil on everything. Everything, it's like you start thinking maybe it's radioactive. Are we even allowed to be here? Best yet is when you simply try to tell them anything, many times they're so offended by the fact that you think you know more than them about cleaning for Pesach. No. Of course there's an halacha, but tradition that they have, that's what they hold by. And certainly, this is a, so long as it doesn't hurt the family, doesn't cause any problems, doesn't hurt them physically, it's not uh, to the extent where by the time they arrive at the holiday, they simply are bedridden for the whole holiday, so long as it's okay, they want to do it, they can do it. But many times this causes a lot of hardship. So, sometimes you want to say something but many times it's to no avail now the chazuni says that's because whatever they learned at their ima and abba's house at their grandparents house has made them so scared that they cannot even fathom not following this they can't fathom not following this now of course the fear of heaven is certainly the foundation of connection to Hashem Yirat Hashem Yotzaro says the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat the fear of heaven that's Hashem's treasure he initially had the Shabbat in his treasure chest and the Gemara Masechet Shabbat says he tells Moshe, Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu, I have a great treasure in my treasure chest. Tell Am Yisrael I'm about to give it to them. What is that treasure? Shabbat. After that, what's left in the treasure chest? The treasure chest has not just any treasure, has the most prized treasure. Now for somebody that has a, uh, a regular person, if they have a safe, they're not going to put all their stuff, their notebooks and their pens in it. No, they're going to put their most prized possession. So to an average person, they may put a thousand dollars in that treasure chest. But if that person was a millionaire, they're not going to put a thousand dollars in a treasure chest. Why? Because it's not a treasure. But if they're a millionaire, if they have a million dollars, they'll put that million dollars in the treasure chest. But if they're a billionaire, they're not going to put a million dollars in a treasure chest. Why? It's not really a treasure. But if you have a hundred million or something that's worth that much, that's going to go in the treasure chest. And if they're a king that has an endless amount of money they're not going to put money in their treasure chest why there's just simply not enough money that it's worth it to go into that treasure chest. what are they going to put the most unique the most valuable the most precious possession they have whether it be jewels or memorabilia or or family uh, uh you know uh, uh heirlooms whatever it is it's going to be their most prized possessions it's certainly not going to be a bunch of dollar bills when it's the king of kings what treasure does he have in his treasure chest? The Torah says, Yirat Hashem, The fear of heaven, that's his treasure. That's what's in his treasure chest. Now, fear of heaven, fear of Hashem, has levels. The lowest level, meaning the basic foundation, is fear of punishment. Fear that a person will lose. Fear that a person would die. Fear that a person would uh, get sick, get hurt in any way. Fear that a person will go to Kafakela or Genom or have a very difficult Chibuta Kevo that lasts for many years. These fears are necessary fears. The highest level of fear is awe of his majesty. That's where Avraham Avinu reached. We understood the creator in such a fashion that he understood that he doesn't want to do anything that can ever hurt the honor of God. And certainly there is love of God. But love of God is something that only very few people ever reach. As Rabbi Nachman Mibreslav himself says, he wishes that the righteous people in his generation would reach fear of the Almighty. Because love of the Almighty is certainly not a possibility for most people. And he's talking about the righteous in his generation. But yet today, every average Joe that 
likes a few songs that have Jewish tunes to them, thinks that he loves God. Or just because he has a little bracelet that says, I love God, or some other statement, they think that they know what loving God is. Loving God, in so many words, means that whatever your desires, whatever your will, whatever you want, simply becomes second, you know, it's just something that's secondary, something that's not relevant. Why? Because everything that Hashem wants, everything that Hashem wills, everything that Hashem has commanded becomes your priority in life most people have no concept of such a thing why because every one of us has certain desires certain needs certain wants but needless to say before we deal with the highest we have to deal with the lowest and there is a huge fight there's literally a spiritual battle we've been fighting for the last 10 years of teaching of people trying to constantly tell the public you don't need to fear god you don't need to fear ganom either because there's no punishment which is completely nonsense because even this world has punishment needless to say the eternal world even the fools that appear to be managing society in this world know that there needs to be a punishment of course the creator the master of all the king of kings knows that there has to be a punishment and when the punishment here is limited but yet very dear could take a person's entire life, could take a person's life itself. Needless to say, the punishment in the world of eternity is much greater than that. But yet, people do not think about this rationally. People do not think about this at all. They simply decide that punishment, it's not relevant. Why? God must love everyone. You know, what if the guy's a murderer, rapist, pedophile? thief ruined lives adulterer it's okay god just loves them anyway so why 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 do you even write a torah why do you write rules if you could just forsake all of them they won't have answers to these things but if they have the audacity they'll tell you yeah no listen do your best and uh don't worry about it you're connected to rabbi nachman you're connected to the lababich rabbi you're connected to avram avinu they'll save you they're gonna take you they tell you something a fairy tale story they're gonna come and they're gonna pull you by your peyot out of genom somehow the fire of genom didn't burn your peyot they're gonna pull you out of genom why because you grew some hair that grows by itself you could be a murderer a rapist or this or that rabbi nachman will take you out now obviously this nonsense is not written anywhere but there are things that are written and we have to clarify once and for all the Mishnah in Masechet Avot, in the second chapter, the sixth Mishnah, you may have the, have this as the fifth Mishnah or even the seventh Mishnah, depending on what type of Nusach you have. But it says, in the name of Hillel, 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 one of the Zugot, the Rabbi of the Rabbi of the Rabbi of Rabbi Akiva, Bet Shammai, Bet Hillel, this is the foundation. Hillel was accustomed to say, a bull, person that's a... Uh, careless about mitzvot to the extent where he simply is like an empty vessel empty hole doesn't have anything you ask him what's this parasha he tells you the news tells him the what holidays are uh, coming up i'll tell you uh i, don't know, I think it's a super bowl clueless doesn't know anything such a person that's clueless about torah Hillel says he cannot be fearful of sin. A clueless person cannot be fearful of sin. Why? He doesn't know enough to even know the magnitude of a sin. It's like if you ask a little tiny, you know, three or four year old boy, average boy, how big is that star? The boy's going to say this big. Why? Because in his eyes, from his perspective, three years old, that's how big the star is. But if you're an adult that's normal, you know that the star is not this big. Rather, this, that star that you can see could very well be much bigger than the earth that you live in. 
But the little boy can't see. Why he thinks because it's far, it's this big. Rabbi Yisrael Misalant says, that's our sins. We're like little boys. The less we know of Torah, the more like a little boy we are. Our sin, from our little perspective, looks like it's this big. In reality, whatever sin you made, whether it's desecrating Shabbat or looking where you're not allowed to look or touching what you're not allowed to touch or eating what you're not allowed to te- eat or even saying what you're not allowed to say, it looks like a little tiny, tiny little big thing. What's the big deal if I said Lashon HaRa? What's the big deal if I spread a rumor? What if it's a big deal if I believe the rumor? What's the big deal if I stole a few dollars? The guy's rich. What's the big deal if I charged interest? What is the big deal if I uh, was dishonest? What's the big deal if I lied a little bit? What's the big deal if I cheated on my wife? What's the big deal if I uh, embarrassed this guy in public? What's the big deal if I did X, Y, Z? What's the big deal? What, God really cares? He has such a big world. He cares about my little sin. It's this big. That's because you're a little boy in Torah. You're a little girl in Torah. You don't think it's a big deal. I had a young girl in her 20s. Tell me, listen, Rabbi, I know I don't keep Shabbat right now, but don't think that I'm uh, ignoramus. I kept Shabbat for four years. I know a lot. It's just, it's not for me right now. I know a lot, but I don't keep Shabbat right now. But I know a lot. Why? I kept Shabbat for four years. I went to seminary. You know a lot and you're desecrating Shabbat? You're desecrating Shabbat and you, you say, at the same time you say you know a lot? No. Why? If you know a lot, you'll be scared to say that you're desecrating Shabbat. If you know a lot, you'd literally be scared to even think of desecrating Shabbat. The reality is, you don't know anything. You think you know. And many people are in that category. They think they know. A lot. When it comes to Torah, people somehow become scholars without ever learning. A bull cannot be fearful of sin, says he then. An Amaharetz cannot be scrupulously pious. A person that is not devoted to learning Torah daily, as a priority in their life, cannot be a scrupulously pious person. They cannot be particular about the judgment. They cannot be particular about the mitzvot. Why? The more you invest into something, the more you care about it. The more you're particular about it. But if you're treating the Torah like it's a relationship on the side, then certainly you're not going to care about the mitzvot. And that comparison was not made by me, it was made by Resh Lakish, Gemara, Masechet Sanhedrin. Resh Lakish says that a person that looks into the Torah from time to time, you know, an hour here, two days later, another hour, four days later, another 20 minutes, whatever he has a chance. He says that person, he's like a womanizer. Every day he's got a different relationship. That's how they're going to look at this guy in Shamaim. He says, oh, I learned Torah. You learned Torah, you're a womanizer. You treated Torah like it was a girlfriend, but a different girlfriend every time. Torah Rabotai is not a girlfriend. Torah is your connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And a person does not have, who does not have a serious relationship with the Torah, cannot be a pious person. And a bashful person cannot learn. You're too shy? You're not going to ask questions? Six months pass, you haven't asked a single question? Guess what? You're never going to become a Talmud Chacham. No, no, I just, Rabbi, listen, I, I, I have questions, but I look at the book, and, uh, and then that's how I figure it out. Who says you're right? What do you mean? It's in a book. Who says you understood the book right? If you ever want to be anything in the world of Torah, it requires for you to be connected to a chacham on a regular basis. I don't mean every two seconds you send a message, oh, Rabbi, what's, uh, what day of the week is it? Uh, Rabbi, when is the chatzot? Rabbi, uh, you know, is this kosher? No, but there has to be questions. There has to be ongoing things. But what ends up happening is many times people just assume that they can figure it out on their own. And that's what we talked about in the last couple of weeks by the chazoni says that a person will do whatever they can to avoid asking the Chacham. Oh, when they do ask the Chacham, they ask for the small stuff. Big decisions, like a new job, a new marriage, a new relationship, a business deal, a loan, uh, a, 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 any type of major financial issue, any type of spiritual decision, that stuff they don't ask. What do they ask? Rabbi, when does the holiday start? The simple stuff they can find on Google. 
if you don't have constant big issues there's something wrong why because that's life there's constant big issues but if your reason for not asking is because you're shy just know that type of character trait when it comes to learning is not good why in order to be a chacham you have to ask questions now he goes on and on we're not going to go through the entire mishnah because the main part that we're seeing here first few things that we mentioned is that this bull this person that's clueless will never have this prerequisite fear of heaven that's necessary in order for you to develop a relationship with god now so if a person didn't learn and you tell them listen don't worry about it just grow these peyote or go to uman or jump in our street say rabbi nachman rabbi nachman wear some silly hat says na 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 or go to the grave of uh, the lubavitch rebbe write some bunch of letters hang out over there call him mashiach or whatever other thing that people tell you to do instead of spending your time learning Torah instead of spending your time toiling into the Gemara toiling into the Shulchan Aruch into the Poskim into the real Torah you're just toiling into all types of man-made instructions and you think that that's going to save you well I have some bad news Avraham Avinu doesn't agree not Rabbi Nachman Avraham Avinu before Rabbi Nachman. Zohar Chadash. Parashat Lech Lecha. Daf Mem Bet Amud Bet. 42b. Based on the verse, the conversation between Avram and the king of Sodom, the king of Sodom. The king of Sodom offers Avram some all the money. Avram says, "No, I don't want nothing." Why? I don't want you to think. I don't want you to ever say that you made me rich. So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and the rest of the Chachamim mentioned in this Gemara in this uh, Zohar go into the details behind the details, further lessons. That are learned from this conversation and it says what is this conversation like between Avram and the king of Zdom this is like the conversation between the angel of Gehenom and the soul of the tzaddik whether that tzaddik is Rabbi Nachman Breslev or the tzaddik is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai or the tzaddik is anybody else that tzaddik that has a lot of merits for that generation the people claim he can take them out of Gehenom. It's a conversation between the angel that runs Gehenom and the tzaddik. And this is what it says. Melech Zdom, Zeus Sarosh of Gehenom. King of Zdom is being played by the, is, uh, is uh, portraying the uh, angel of Gehenom. Aomed ala reshaim vehu melech Zdom, uma omer le neshama shu Avram, Tell me a nefesh yachotet. This angel of Genom says to Avram, says to the soul of the tzaddik, give me the souls of the wicked that sin. As it says, a nefesh yachotet itamut, this is in Yechezke, he's quoting a verse. Klomar, tell me a nefesh yachotet the angel of Genom says to the tzaddik give me this soul of the wicked people that uh, follow their desires so that way it can be judged for all of the things all this evil that they did and don't pray for it don't let your prayer because you're righteous take these souls away from me and 
but instead but take all of the righteous people that did tshuva save them from Ganom. leave me the wicked people you take the righteous people that did tshuva don't pray for the wicked people that's mine you take yours i take mine Amar Rabbi Yehuda, באותה שעה נשמה מהי אומרת? Rabbi Yehuda says at that moment, what is the neshama of the tzaddik that's represented by Avraham? What does he say? ויאמר Avraham אל מלך צדוק, מרי מותי ידאי אל Hashem אל ליליון בשבועה שלא יתפלל ולא יקח לאותם הרשאים. It's as if Avraham is saying, raising his hands, raising his hands in the air. It says, I swear in the name of God that I will not pray or take those wicked people. Throws an atomic bomb on all of those people that think you could be saved by going to this and going to that that we've repeated multiple times. What does he say? He says, Those people, those people, those wicked people, they sin, they follow their desires. I know them. Why? In that world, I went and I rebuked them. I told them to do tshuva. And in fact, I gave them all the details of what happens in Genom. I gave them the details of everything that happens in Gehenom. And they didn't want to listen to me. And that's why I'm not going to pray. I swear I'm not going to pray for them. They're all yours. Do what you will with them. Zohar, Parashat Lech Lecha, page 42b. Later on, it also brings... Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi. Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, who went one of the ten people that went to Gan Eden alive. He hears what's going on in Gehenom. He hears crying of the wicked people that are in Gehenom. Starts praying for them. He gets yelled at from Shemaim. Hey! Stop praying for the wicked people. Shut your mouth, it says even. Shut to Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, Tzadik, Kodesh Kodeshim. In Shem, they told him, shut your mouth, do not pray for these wicked people. Your prayer is not allowed. Why? They deserve to be there. Avraham doesn't pray for them. Avraham Avinu doesn't pray for them. Why? They put themselves in there. He told them about Gainom. They didn't want to hear. In fact, the Zohar in Parashat Vayera, Talks about Avraham Avinu. What did Avraham Avinu tell all these people that came to him? He had four doors to his house. His huge tent. Sarah was a world-renowned chef. Enormous amount of food. Guests coming from all over the world. At some point, you either have to pay or you have to listen. Either pay for the food or you have to listen to Dvar Torah. And say Birkat Amazon. Zohar Kadosh says, What Dvar Torah? What did, what did Avraham Avinu say to these people, Dvar Torah? What did he say to them? They knew they really, these people just started. What did he say to them? Parashat Vayera and Zohar says, Avraham Avinu taught them about the details of Gehenom. So this is why Avraham here, Parashat Lech Lecha, is saying, All these wicked people that you have in Gehenom, I'm not going to pray for them. I swear to you, I'm not going to pray for them. Why? Because I already tried. I told them the details of Gehenom. I told them what's going to happen to them if they go against God. I told them. They didn't want to listen. They didn't want to listen. They ended up there. You have my word? I am not going to pray for them. So here we see, Rabotai, something that finally relieves us from this false belief that someone is going to save us other than ourself. Our own tshuva, our own repentance, our own good deeds, that can help us. 
But if you think that you can live a life of evil and somehow go to heaven, you have the wrong religion, buddy. You have the wrong idea. Now, a person may have a hard time taking this. Say, wait a minute, but, but, but Avram, that, that's, that's my grandfather. Maybe, maybe, uh, okay, you know what, maybe Avram, Avram is a little too tough. He's like you, Rabbi. He's like, he's like Musa, if I was like just a grain of sand next to him. But you know, you know, God, God, God loves us, and he, uh, he's going to forgive us. You know, he doesn't want to destroy everything. And they always bring you the source. What's the source? God regretted destroying the world after the flood. Yeah, what is he regretted? Look, it says it over there in the Torah. Parashat Noach. Oh, yeah. Let's see. The Gemara. Masechet Sanhedrin, Perek Chelek. Page 108a. Says... The Torah says in a, uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 6, that Hashem, Vainachim, which can be worded as reconsidered, having made man on earth. When Rav Dimi came to Babylonia from Eretz Israel, he said, Amara Kadosh what does this mean? The Holy One blessed as he said, I did well, and that I prepared graves for them on earth. Meaning that I destroyed that I destroyed all of them. That was good. That was good that I destroyed all of them. But how come it says Vainachem? So the Gemara explains. Vainachem is not saying that Hashem reconsidered or felt bad. No. The Gemara explains that this Vainachem Hashem is saying that he was comforted by the fact that he did it. Implying that Akadosh Baruch Hu found comfort in his decision to destroy mankind. Why? Because that was the law. So how come some people will say, yeah, but, but, but it could also mean otherwise. He changed, he this. No, no. Initially, when he created the world, this is in the name of the Maharal. He explains, initially when HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the world, he created it with judgment alone. He saw that the world would not... Would not survive with just judgment so there was mercy and there was mercy for a very long time only and all of this mercy brought an endless amount of blessings to mankind to the point where they literally enjoyed heaven on earth everyone was rich everyone was beautiful everyone had everything they could possibly imagine the weather was always perfect Everything was perfect. And instead of being grateful to Hashem, what they say, what do we need Hashem for? Other than giving us some rain. And even that, we already have enough water in the oceans and the uh, rivers. T they took the gift that Hashem gave them and used it against them. And that's what brought them to many, many sins. The Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin says the main sin that created this catastrophe was immorality wasting seed adultery rape pedophilia homosexuality and so on hashem destroyed the world and he was comforted by the fact that now he implemented the judgment again like he did in the beginning meaning now it's a balance in the beginning initially it was supposed to be just the judgment. He saw that the world wouldn't exist, so he brought the mercy. The world went on 
for about 1500 years just with mercy mankind used it in essence against God so God brought back the judgment and he wasn't regretful of destroying the world but rather he was comforted by the fact that he destroyed the world because that brought back the initial decision this is why the when Moshe Rabbeinu saw the future and he saw that Rabbi Akiva was being killed in such a horrible fashion that they were literally peeling off his skin and then chopping him up and then selling his meat in the market and Moshe Rabbeinu says this is Torah and this is its uh, reward Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu be quiet that's how I created the world meaning initially the world was created with this type of judgment judgment only meaning this was my original idea just to have judgment now again we have a balance now but needless to say a person that says God regretted creating the world is misunderstanding that's what you need to learn now if a person has a good measure of fear of the creator that in itself can be the greatest guide to do the right thing the greatest way the greatest indication or indicator of which way is right which way is wrong now many people are anxious about too many things to the point of these little anxieties becoming fears they're afraid of the government the government's depopulation the government taking taxes the government vaccine the government this the government that people have all these conspiracies in their mind some are real some are fake but they forget that God is the one that runs the world and they are petrified of the government so much so that they turn themselves into some form of recluse some form of conspiracy theorists and they are no longer able to relate to the normalcy of society the the the, the they cannot they cannot norm uh, they cannot associate with anyone normal they cannot even learn Torah in a normal fashion because everything that they learn they always want to connect it to their predisposition that this oh yeah what it says over here at the end of the world oh yeah of course because the uh, the guy on uh something info wars says that something's gonna happen everything is like in essence instead of the Torah being the guide instead of the Torah being the blueprint to creation conspiracy theories are their blueprint and obviously this is a very sick thing but it's, it's happening and it's on the rise especially in the last couple of years many from people have turned into conspiracy theories to the magnitude of a hundred because of all the vaccines and all that stuff that happens and of course some of them that may be watching right now says, yeah but I was right yeah but you ruined your life right wrong you ruined your life you didn't save your life you're alive because God says you'll be alive not because of your conspiracy theories and because you took or you didn't take the vaccine you're alive because God decided that you are that's what Rabbi Ephraim writes in his Sicha Shvuit the Sefer Sicha Shvuit in Parashat um, Tazria in the name of the Chafetz Chaim someone asked him uh, the Chafetz Chaim about different things and the Chafetz Chaim says is the sun gonna come up tomorrow and I said yes Chafetz Chaim says how do you know and the guy said well because it did that yesterday and the day before and the day before Chafetz Chaim says yeah that's the wrong answer though so what's the right answer the sun will rise tomorrow because it says so in the Torah in Parashat Noach Yom lo yishbotu. the day and night will never cease that's why the sun will rise it's not going to rise because it did it yesterday whatever exists in the world exists because the Torah says so not because you got used to it 
or because the, the news says so. So a person that is afraid of all of these things, new world orders, conspiracies, they have a very, very difficult and nearly impossible time to learn Torah because they're constantly guided by a very, very strong belief in some former, in some outside power. On the depths of it, you could even call it some form of idolatry because they literally believe that these outside powers are more powerful than they really are. They forget that God runs the world. And of course, they'll justify by saying, no, but there's Ishtadlut and there's laws in the Torah that says you have to protect yourself. And everyone's going to justify their behavior. But needless to say, those fears are certainly not making anybody's life any better. Some people have developed such anxieties against the government that they literally can't live their life. Some people have developed anxieties against people in general. They think that everyone is out there to get them. They can't survive in a job. They can't survive in a relationship. They can't survive in in basic relationships that are friendships. Why? Something has to be wrong. Why, Why is he calling me? Why is he this? Why is he that? Why do you want this? They think everyone's out there to get them. And they have these anxieties and these fears that someone is out there to get them. Why did you say that that way? They think too deeply into everything. They microanalyze every word. You write them a four-word text message. They analyze it for two and a half days. Why did you use this language and not that? Why did you use that word? Why did you send me the message at that time? Is it because I said something to you and you have no idea what they're talking about? And then you finally realize that they're referring to a text message they sent you four days ago as if you remember. And unfortunately, this sickness is growing. The anxieties that people have destroy their lives. Some people have a very big anxiety when it comes to food. They're afraid that whatever they're preparing is not going to be good enough. Whoever is eating is not going to be happy. And it's not because they're a restaurateur. They're a simple wife or husband or whoever they're cooking for someone. Or worse yet, they're ordering food for people to eat. And they're afraid that some of the people are not going to like it. And then they're going to be there to blame. Oh, I'm ordering. They're asking me to be in charge of ordering food for this event. I don't know if anybody's going to like it. I don't know. And instead of literally spending a half hour just placing the order, three and a half days, and they still haven't placed the order. Why? They're analyzing. What is this one like? What is that one like? What is this? What is that? I don't know. They're stressed out. They lost sleep. Just pick up the phone, plus pick a meal, times it by the number of people that are coming in the end. But they're too afraid. They're too anxious. Some people are afraid of moving forward in business or any type of new relationship. They have the ability to grow. They have the ability to do more. But they're afraid to move forward. Why? New is scary. Why don't you sign a deal with them? I don't know. I don't know. What's the catch? The catch is he wants to make more money. That's the catch. Yeah, but why did he call me? Uh, because you're, he views you as an opportunity to make more money. Ah, so he's trying to make money on me. Yeah, that's the point of business. Oh, so he's trying to get me. No, no, he's just trying to make money. And he's, you have a contract that you could read. He has a contract that he could read. And if you agree to the terms, the end. Yeah, but what if, what if something happens? That's the point of the contract. Something happens is the point of the contract that tells you what happens if something happens. Yeah, but what if he doesn't agree? And you start looking at these people like, you know what? How did you, how did you, how did you leave your house? Does somebody dress you in the morning still? And you're not sure how they proceed with life, but that's unfortunately sometimes. Sometimes some people are that way. They can't proceed forward. They're too scared to move. They're too scared to take risks. They're too scared to proceed. The worst shit is when people have literally programmed themselves to be scared to miss a phone call. This is certainly a fear that's self-inflicted 
to the addiction that people have to their phones the phone rings and it doesn't matter what they're doing they could be literally in the shower and they run out of the shower hello yeah yeah i'll call you back and they put like you know there's a voicemail you know the voicemail was created like i don't know 40 years ago i think it was created even before the phones like let the phone go to go, let the call go to voicemail no but what if it's important they'll call back if it's important or they'll leave a message what if it's an emergency are you police no are you an ambulance no fire station no so what difference does it make if it's an emergency you can't help anyway but people are afraid to miss phone calls the point of everything that i'm saying to you is that you see that people have literally developed fears for everything but the moment you tell them you're obligated to be afraid of god because if you don't follow him you'll get punished severely much more than you can comprehend immediately people think that no nah, i can't be wait so you're afraid of the phone you're afraid of the new world order that exists or doesn't exist you're afraid of some everything else but being afraid of god that that you're having a hard time with do you know why because the evil inclination the satan he doesn't interfere with you being afraid of everything else in fact he tries to help you being afraid of everything else keep you busy being afraid of everything else because that is either not fulfilling your purpose or is actually going against your purpose in this world but to be afraid of god that certainly is going to get you to fulfill your purpose hence the reason of why he will do everything in his power to get you not to be afraid of god so the chazoni says that there are some people that have this gift of being afraid of all the violations are you afraid of all the violations you watched the shiur thus far you're an hour and a half into it by now you should ask yourself are you afraid before you do everything not just the stuff that you know off the top of your head that you're afraid of i'm afraid to violate shabbat that's because you keep shabbat oh, i'm afraid to uh, eat non-kosher well that's because you eat kosher what about the other stuff that you don't do regularly that hasn't become a part of your day-to-day -day life are you afraid of doing honest business are you afraid of doing dishonest business are you afraid of hurting somebody insulting somebody disrespecting somebody are you afraid of misunderstandings are you afraid that your kids will not follow the torah are you afraid that perhaps one of your beliefs may be incorrect are you afraid that you may not have that much time in this world are you afraid of punishment are you really afraid before you do anything because if a person is truly afraid that means they have to think about it regularly Shlomo Melech says the beginning of wisdom is fear of heaven this does not mean that a person hides under the desk and doesn't operate but rather this is a person that takes into account god reward punishment which one is this decision going to lead me to which decision every decision if i'm about to write this text is this text going to be in the category of reward or punishment if i'm about to answer this phone call is this phone call going to be reward or punishment how could a call be reward and punishment a million ways one are you in the middle of studying torah and now you're going to disrupt the torah to, to answer the call certainly that's in the punishment area unless it's life risk and you know for sure it's life risk not possible life risk or it's one of your friends they like to talk they want to tell you about 
so and so's engagement so and so's uh accident so and so's adultery so and so's movie so and so's this like talk about people certainly the punishment area not the reward area a phone call is more likely to be in a punishment area than the uh reward area why because when you talk to people the more they talk unless they're talking torah usually they're talking about things that will cause you to sin or it's sin itself going to a certain place is that place going to lead you to reward or punishment whether it's a party an event uh, food laundry everything is it going to be reward or punishment the more a person is afraid of god the more they're going to take god with them in every single decision and chazoni says that some people have this spiritual genealogy that they've inherited they've acquired through inheritance that it's in a particular way where they already have it without having to go through the same journey and build up process that the rest of us do they already have it now it's not necessarily across the board but certainly they have it how could this be he says this constant habit has become a part of them compelling him to fear all the violations of the law and it has a source where is the source a Torah scholar who was his father or teacher or his teacher's teacher meaning that this fear didn't just wasn't just they weren't just born with it for no reason this came from somewhere their father their mother their teacher their teacher's teacher certainly someone that has influence on them the power of the Torah of his teacher has put down roots in his student or son as well to make him devoted to strict law observance though he himself has not merited to labor over the study of Allah sufficiently this means says the Chazunish that the Torah stands in good stead for the person himself and also for the coming generations that benefit from its influence these students are on a very high level and they are the apex both in terms of observance of mitzvot and corrections of character traits but they are few very few because usually in order to achieve this level they must be born with these corrected traits those whose nature is harder need the hard work of torah study to train them to such a level so here the chazonish clarifies the whole thing and lets us know yes there are unique people that have inborn traits either something that's literally through their lineage or something that they've acquired just by simply being around specific people in their life their father their mother their teacher their rabbi taught them something specific they were brought up in a certain type of environment where they were programmed to be afraid of immorality programmed to be afraid of stealing programmed to be afraid of all these types of things and he says these people are amazing people but they're very few there was one time an admo that was asked you are an admo head rabbi of a certain chassidut because your father's an admo he was a big tzaddik and your father was an admo because his father was an admo and all of these you know each one was a big tzaddik big righteous person but what merit do you have i mean all of these tzaddikim we already know their history how righteous they were how awesome they were in their servitude of hashem but what do you say is your merit that gave you the ability to be the admo and the admo says my merit is that i was born on high ground what is that like he says imagine a person going on 
a journey to go climb Mount Everest. He takes the equipment and he starts climbing. Hour after hour, day after day, he almost loses his life a few times and he keeps climbing and climbing to eventually get to the top of Mount Everest. And after an extraordinary amount of effort, changing his shoes, changing the equipment, nearly dying on the process, he finally gets to the top of the mountain. And as soon as he gets there, the first thing he notices is a group of young kids jumping around and playing. He says to them, Whoa, how, how did you get here? How, how did you get here? And all the kids look at him and like, We were born here. Our house is right there. He says, that's it. Yes, I'm an Admol because my father's an Admol because grandfather's an Admol, all that, yes. And some of us have the merit to be born on a high ground. We have a different mission. That doesn't necessarily mean that everybody succeeds. But certainly, you have a different level that you started at. And as the Chazuni says, if you're not one of those people that your father, grandfather, great-grandfather is one of the most righteous people in the world and you were born on a high level, you are already the second in command, you're Yosef at Sadiq in, in the making, don't be too hard on yourself. Why? Those are very few in number. There are very, very few people that are born at that level. Those are people that Hashem selects. But guess what? Sometimes, even if Hashem has a person born in that high level and puts them in a position to be the greatest leader the, water, the world has ever seen, they could ruin it and lose it all. One of the examples we have in the Torah is the brother of David Melech, Eliav. The Sefer, remove anger from your heart, brings the one of the most extraordinary stories you're ever going to hear. Where it talks about, it brings the Gemara Masechet Psachim, where the Gemara says that Eliav, the brother of David, he was the oldest brother. He was beautiful, smart, tall. Everything was going for him. In fact, when Shmuel, Shmuel the Navi, came to the Yishai's house with the mission that Hashem sent him to go and put the special oil on the next king, he didn't know who the next king was, but Shmuel was a prophet. Mara says Shmuel had the highest level of prophecy aside from Moshe Rabbeinu. You, in, his, in his generation was something unbelievable. I will also learn at some point that Isaiah had the highest level of prophecy aside from Moshe Rabbeinu. But needless to say, Shmuel was like something out of this world. His righteousness... And he got certain privileges that even Moshe Rabbeinu didn't get. Where Hashem would speak to him at places that he wouldn't speak to Moshe because Shmuel sacrificed himself and went from place to place. Whereas Moshe Rabbeinu was with Am Yisrael in one place at all times. Either way, Shmuel did not know who the next king is going to be. He knew that Shaul was the king. Hashem no longer wanted Shaul to be a king. And he said that the next king is going to come from the family of Ishai, one of his sons. Shuel comes into the house, and as soon as he sees Ishai's oldest son, Eliav, he thinks he is perfectly fit to be the next king. He's beautiful, he's tall, he's smart, 
He saw much more than the physicality aspect of it. He's a prophet. And he took out the oil to put on him to see if he's the next king. And miraculously, the oil disappeared as if it was never there. And he knew that Hashem did not choose him to be the king. Later on, when David came, after all of the brothers were not designated to be the king, were not chosen to be the king, and the oil wouldn't pour on any of them, they called out to David, and as soon as David entered the room, the oil came out in a miraculous fashion out of the bottle of Shmuel and flew in the air. Along with David, both of them meeting, and everyone knew David became the Mashiach Hashem. And from him will come Mashiach. But the Chachamim ask, why wasn't Eliav chosen to be the king? This has major ramifications. Not only being the king of Am Yisrael, but the Mashiach coming from him. The Mashiach was originally supposed to come from Eliav. That's what the Gemara says. He was originally supposed to be the guy. It's not that Hashem always chose David. Originally, Eliav was supposed to be. But he lost it. Why did he lose it? He got angry. His character trait, weakness of anger, lost him the choice of being the king the position of being a king the position of being the grandfather of the mashiach here in the sefer remove anger from your heart it brings multiple sources one of them being the gemara masech psachim page 66b along with other chachamim like the level yaw discuss this monumental story of how Eliav was literally created to be someone that was going to be the next king but he lost it because of a character flaw a character weakness of anger so we see from here that as the Chazoni says some people are born into these special families they have these natural inclinations to do good. They were born very high. And they're very special. But it doesn't mean they automatically reach their fullest potential. They still have free choice. They still have a very, very big battle. And usually much bigger than everybody else's. Just like their position is great, their potential is great, their obligation is great, and their downside is great. Now, most people see things from an outside perspective after it was already done. Very few people actually go to the source of what got it to that point. One of the great families that's in the world with us for the last few hundred years is the Abu Chatzila family. Everyone has heard, even the Goim have heard about the Abu Chatzila family. The Babasali has been one of the most famous names in the world for the last several decades. But his name was not the first one. This, the Babasali, the, the Abu Chatzila family goes back hundreds of years. Now, if you compare the Abu Chatzira family to the Rothschild family, both names have been in Judaism for many, many years. Both names have been symbolic of a certain level of success. Both families started with very righteous people. The original Rothschild was a very righteous person, Talmit Chacham, very honest in business. And was a very big Baal Chesed. Did whatever he could to help those that are in need. 
On the other hand, the Abu Chatzira family were very devoted to the Torah. Part of the Torah is to do chesed, and certainly they did their chesed, their fair share of chesed. But if you learn about the family, it's not necessarily the one thing that they're known for. They're known for their Torah. They're known for, for their miracle workers. And surely they do an endless amount of chesed, but that's not necessarily the one place that the world knows them by. The Rothschild family, people know that they're very wealthy and they have helped certain people, even though obviously many things have changed and we'll talk about that in a moment. But the truth is that if you look at the original source of both families, they both started with great acts of chesed. The Rothschild family started with the original Meir Rothschild who went into business. He was a Talmud Chacham. He was very devoted to his rabbi. When his rabbi thought that he stole from him, he sold all of his belongings just to give the rabbi the money. And when the rabbi found out that he really didn't steal from him because the real thief was caught, he blessed him that he'd be successful in that blessing. Certainly came to, uh, and was fulfilled now the Abu Chatzira family wasn't started the same way you have the Rabbi Shmuel Elbaz being the original Abu Chatzira Tamid Chacham Kabbalist devoted to the Torah in unprecedented ways. And he was in the Yerushalayim learning Torah and one day they asked of him to please go to Constantinople and gather some money because the poverty in Eretz Israel was so bad that literally people were starving without thinking twice of course he accepted the task to be the messenger he took a few books took his rug his tefillin, talit and was on his way to Jaffa at Jaffa he got to the uh, boat over there that was going to Constantinople and tried to get on. He heard that the guy that's running the boat yelling at everybody and he realized this is the guy in charge and as soon as he tried to get on the guy said, Wait, where's the money? He said, I'm sorry, I don't have any money. He said, no money, no boat. He said, well, please, please let me go on the boat. I need to help. The poor people of Yerushalayim. I need to go and help them to get money from our brothers over there. And the wicked guy running the boat would have nothing of it, cared less about it. Said, no boat, no money, no boat. Rabbi Shmuel Abu Chatzira did not lose hope. Instead, he realized that he did his ishtadlut, his effort, went to the side, took out his rug, put it on the ground on the beach over there right next to the boat and started learning Torah. As he's learning more and more Torah, more people are getting on this boat little by little it's filled up and they're ready to leave last call they start going and as soon as the boat starts going Rav Elbaz miraculously starts going also but on his rug and the rug goes into the water, floating above the water, in front of hundreds of people, 
that are watching this from the boat. And the boat is going, and Rav Elbaz is going. And in fact, Rav Elbaz is going a little faster than the boat. People are amazed by this, and then they, to get the attention of the captain of the ship, the wicked guy that didn't let him on, he sees this, and he realizes that he just made a mistake of his life. This guy is an angel. How did I not let him on the boat? What did I do to myself? And he starts calling, please, please. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And eventually, Rav Elbaz looks up and he realizes, oh, he's in the water. And he goes back to his books. And the guy keeps calling him because they're right, literally right next to each other in the middle of the ocean. Please, please come on the boat. Please come on the boat. Rav Elbaz looks at him and goes, no, Baruch Hashem. It looks like Akadosh Baruch Hu took care of me. I don't need to be on the boat, but thank you. No worries. Everything is okay. And he goes back to the books. And moments later, in front of hundreds of people that are watching this, of Elbaz is on this carpet, but zooms through the water as like a speedboat and gets to Constantinople in no time. In front of hundreds of people on that boat, and hundreds more when he arrived. Because people who are there saw this. Of course, the word and the story spread all over the world. And from that point on, his name was changed from, instead of Elbaz, Abu Khatsila, the father of the carpet or the rug. And until this day, the family is known by that name, by that original, extraordinary miracle. Now, if you look at the history of the family, you'll see that one after another, there were many, many righteous people in the family. Many great rabbis, Dayanim, Kabbalists. But what you also see is the extraordinary amount of chesed that they did. To help the poor people. People would literally give endless amount of money to the family that would give them from that, that person's hand right to the poor people. And the amount of charity that they've given to society over the years is endless. And I'm certain has been much more than some of the more wealthy families. Like the Rothschilds. Why? You see, although the original Rothschild was very righteous and did a lot of great things, when the priority was chesed and not Torah, that means that that chesed could be transferable into whatever that next generation believes to be the most important charity that needs to be. And therefore, when the next generations became less and less Torah observant, they remained wealthy, but their charitable donations didn't continue going into the world of Torah. Some of it went to places that it's forbidden to even help, whether it be Christianity, churches, uh, uh, things that are not exactly uh, the, the ways of Torah, only God knows where all that where all the money went. But I can assure you it didn't go only to Torah. Why? Because you see from what happened to the descendants. They got further and further from Torah. Some of them intermarried. Some of them are openly homosexual. Some of them are literally a disgrace to the original righteous people that started it. Because although the wealth transferred, the good traits did not transfer. On the other hand, in the Abu Chatzira family, in the Pinto family, in other many righteous families in Judaism, and there are Baruch Hashem, plenty of them, when the family's founders made Torah the priority, that means that that priority transferred to the next generation. And those good traits also transferred to the next generation. 
And that's what the Ran says. The Ran says in his Drashot Aran in the fifth Darush. He says that the mitzvahs and the sins that are from the Torah, there are certain types of them that only affect the body. But there are some of them that affect the soul itself to the extent where they actually damage the neshama, damage the soul to the point where it transfers to the next generation because it becomes bad character traits such as hatred, jealousy, uh, viciousness, and the like which actually damage the body and the soul. And a person that is, for example, an angry person that does not overcome that trait, that trait transfers to the children. And that's why he says, when you see kids with bad character traits, it's an indication that that's how their parents are too. Because those traits come from somewhere when the Torah was a priority for Rav Elbaz to such an extent that he had such strong faith in Hashem that he knew he did he exerted the most effort that he possibly could he got to the boat he learned this Torah he's going on a mission to collect money to help poor people there's nothing else he can do so let's go learn more Torah he didn't go back home he didn't cry he didn't complain. He didn't steal. He simply stuck to the plan. Hashem says, oh, you did everything you could. I'm going to do what I could. In front of countless people, this miracle happened. But this miracle continues generation after generation. There were countless miracles that were seen in front of hundreds of people by the Babasali and others that were part of this family. And the Torah has always been the priority. And they're always known for the Torah. Despite the fact that they've literally given millions and millions of dollars to help people. Why? Because it's the Torah that has kept that name what it was and what it is. Not the Staka or the chesed or everything else. Those things are good. But they're only good if they're under the instructions of the Holy Torah. We see from here, Rabotai, that there are many people out there that regret the fact or are upset about the fact that they weren't born into a from family into a family that sent them to yeshiva i also didn't go to yeshiva when i was a kid but guess what even if a person went to yeshiva it doesn't mean that they necessarily got the upper hand or the advantage because the reality is that the vast majority of us have to work hard to reach our purpose our purpose is more than just what we start with. Our purpose is to first and foremost recognize that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the king of all kings. To have a constant fear of going against him. As if we were taught this as little kids and programmed to fear every single little thing. Because if we have that as our steering wheel, certainly it's going to eliminate most of the mistakes that we make in life and it's also going to lead our children in a much better path than the ones we all started on and in fact that handicap if you will that many of us started with where we weren't brought up in a religious family 
or we were brought up in a religious family, but we fell off, or we thought we knew, but then we realized that we don't know, or whatever it is that got us to this point where we realized that we have to do tshuva, that handicap could actually be the best thing that ever happened to us. Because now that we know where we need to be, we can also capitalize on it in such a way where all of those things that we discovered in our path that was against Hashem, path that was away from Hashem, can now be used in order to help other people get out of that path, get out of those, those wrong ways. And that's why the Mesilat Yisharim, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lusato, writes about 300 years ago, if you want to learn Torah, learn from a Baal Tshuva. Because he's not only going to tell you about the right things to do, he's also going to tell you how to get away from the wrong things based on his experience as well as his Torah. So you see, Abutai, there are unique people out there that are born on a very, very high pedestal. You shouldn't be jealous of something that you know nothing of. You should be more focused on building yourself and your next generation and the next generation's next generation to have the better character traits because the better you are as a mother the better you are as a father the better your kids are going to be if you're not angry if you're not stingy if you're not a jealous person if you're not a person that talks bad about other people for no reason if you're not a selfish person then guess what that's what your kids will inherit and that's worth a whole lot more than money and in fact that's what a lot of people are jealous of and those things don't come for free it's only through a lot of effort and you can give it to them by simply doing what you're supposed to be doing anyway Bezat Hashem this too will give us the necessary chizuk instructions and most importantly inspiration to do better by following the Torah following the mitzvot without steering right or left simply following what God says with a smile on even when it hurts because you know that if he did it then he's doing it for you Bezat Hashem will learn again later on this week we have a couple of more lectures Bezat Hashem regarding Jewish intimacy questions and answers May Hashem give us the strength and ability to give those lectures as well and be inspired even further together. Thank you again for learning with me. May Hashem bless each and every single one of you. Those of you that want to support and help us do everything that we're doing and become partners with us and all the wonderful things that the organization is doing, go to bhtorah.org or bezratashem.org or you can donate on the YouTube channel. There's a little join button that you could donate through or you could donate on the facebook or many other places you could donate if you really want it there are certainly plenty of ways to do it